By way of introduction, it's important to be reminded that the end time church is ordained to walk in dominion in all spheres of life before Jesus returns. Every department. Psalm 110 verse 1 down to verse 3. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He said, the Lord will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So from scriptures it is clear that God has ordained the end time church to walk in practical dominion over sickness and disease. Because every sphere of life is covered. He said, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And one of the enemies of man is sickness and disease. Sickness is not a friend. Can we all agree that sickness is not a friend? Disease is not a friend. Nobody prays to have sickness. No one goes to look for disease. It is an enemy of man. And the Bible tells us that the rod of the strength of Christ is being sent forth from Zion to cause us to rule in the midst of our enemies. And those enemies, like we said, include sickness and disease. That's why we are told in Isaiah 33 and verse 24 that none of the inhabitants will say, I am sick. But it's important to note that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And this is very important because we must come to realize that many of the health crises we see in our day and our age are the product of satanic oppressions. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, the Bible tells us there, it said, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So many of those sicknesses we saw in scriptures, the Bible describes them as satanic oppressions. In the book of Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and verse 17, look at what the Bible tells us there. It says, and at even time, they came. It said, when even time was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the evil spirit with his word and healed all that were sick. And verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, saying himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So in verse 17, he was referring to those two occurrences. He says some of them had devils with them. Others of them had what, what was sicknesses in them. He said, and every one of them were references to the fact that he took our infirmities. So infirmities many times are the product of spiritual entities. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. In the book of Luke chapter 13 and verse 11, the Bible tells us about a woman who had been bound with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. In other words, when you look at this woman, it will look like she had a particular disease, like she had a particular sickness. But what was behind it was a spirit, a spiritual entity. This morning, whatever represents any spiritual entity, that may have held anyone bound by the word of the Lord you are receiving this morning, your liberty is established. Because we are fighting a spiritual battle, we must therefore let no one despise the proven weapons that are in our hands. No one must be permitted to despise the proven weapons that are in our hands. David took a sling and a stone and was going towards Goliath. It was the weapon that had been proven. I'd like you to understand that this morning and all through this month, what we are going to be looking at are proven weapons that have access to unquestionable victory. My prayer is that via the word of the Lord that we receive this month, sickness and disease will no longer be mentioned among us in the name of Jesus. Now, quickly, some of the spirits behind diverse sicknesses and diseases 
as follows. Two of them we look at this morning. Number one is the spirit of fear. Say with me the spirit of fear. Say louder the spirit of fear. It's important to note that fear is not a psychological phenomenon. Fear is a spirit. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says that God has not given unto us the spirit of fear. So, fear is described in scriptures as a spirit. It is a spirit. It's important to note that fear is the bait of the enemy to provoke destruction. In the book of Job chapter 3 verse 24 and 25, the Bible makes us understand this. It says, verse 24, it says, For my sign come before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. It says, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Fear is the bait of the devil. When the devil wants to introduce destruction, he first sends the advanced team of fear. It is when fear is embraced that the devil can gain entrance. Fear is the bait of the devil. God's servant shared the testimony with us. He even repeated it again this morning. He said, one day he saw himself while asleep in a coffin. And instead of being afraid, you know, most people when they see that, what happens immediately is the introduction of fear. He said, right inside that dream, he began to give responses. He said, devil, you are stupid because there is no wisdom or knowledge in the grave. No man sees himself inside the coffin and remains there. You see, the devil is always looking for ways to introduce fear into the hearts of men. That's why you have many people today being held captive by the devil. Captive by the devil. Somebody comes to you and approaches you and says, Hey, I saw something about you. The thing I saw about you is very, very scary. Please be very, very careful. It's like there are some dark shadows that are falling upon your life and destiny. And then the person becomes afraid. So what should I do? What do I do now? What do I do now? You see, the bait of fear has been released. And then the devil now gains entrance. When you want to catch a fish with a hook, you put a bait on it. The bait is there to attract the fish. Fear is there to pull an individual into the trap of the devil. But I pray today that every spirit of fear that may have ravaged any life here, today marks the end of it forever. I said today marks the end of it forever. Today marks the end of it forever. Do you know that according to scripture, Satan cannot kill you until he scares you? That is the scriptural position. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15. The Bible tells us there, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that he might, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is the devil, had, H-A-D, past tense, he doesn't have it, he used to have it. He says, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The chain that Satan uses to tie a believer is fear. That means that Satan cannot kill you without your permission. Until he scares you, he can't kill you. Is someone getting what God is saying? So remind yourself if you are in Christ, I am unkillable. Why? Because I refuse to become one that is subject to fear. If you are not subject to fear, you are not subject to bondage. For somebody hearing my voice today, every bondage that may have kept you tied before now, I see liberty established in the name of Jesus. But there are two important keys for anyone that will enjoy a fear-free life, number one is righteousness. When a man has a stand with God, that man can stand before his adversaries. 
righteousness. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs 28 and verse 1, it says that the wicked man, the, the wicked man flees when no one pursues. He said, but the righteous is as bold as a lion. The righteous. So it takes righteousness to maintain boldness. It takes righteousness to maintain boldness. Where there is no righteousness, there is timidity. You become afraid even when there is nothing happening. In other words, for anyone to be able to maintain this kind of boldness that gives us access to victory, there is a need for righteousness. Righteousness is not just having a right position in, in God by Jesus Christ, but it is living out Jesus Christ's standards. Right living. That's righteousness. First John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible said that he that doeth righteousness is righteous. So number one key is righteousness. Number two key, if you are going to operate in the field, Free zone of life is you must build up your faith. Faith is the answer to fear. Faith is the answer to fear. Faith is the answer to fear. If you want to win the battle against fear, then build your faith. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible said that those that believe have entered into rest, they can't be intimidated. Their heart is at peace. Why? Because they have come to the point of faith. When you come to the point of faith, you have arrived at the end of fear. When you come to the point of faith, you have arrived at the end of fear. Fear can be cheaply crucified where faith is amplified. Build your faith and you will break your fear. Build your faith and you will break your fear. This is so important. So our faith is the answer to our fear. In the book of Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, the Bible tells us there Jesus speaking. He said, and it came to pass as his, he said, he asked them and said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith. The presence of fear was the pointer to the absence of faith. Where faith is present, fear is absent. If I build my faith, I will break my fear. If I build my faith, I will break my fear. God's servant has shared this before. He said, Somebody said that when fear knocks at the door, send faith to open and you will find out that there is nobody there. When fear knocks at the door, send faith to open and you will find that there is no one there. Fear will no longer have a hold upon you. <laughs> Number two is the spirit of deformity. The spirit of deformity. Again, in Luke chapter 13, verse 11, all the way down to verse 16, we have this testimony of a woman which we began looking at earlier. This woman had been bound with what the Bible referred to as a spirit of infirmity for 18 solid years. And the Bible says that she was bound together and could in no wise lift up herself. Medically, somebody may call this scoliosis, but the Bible says that this woman was bound by a spirit of infirmity. And Jesus looked at her and said, Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, Satan tied her, this 18 years be loosed? And he touched her, and the Bible says that she was loosed immediately and stood up straight. In other words, there was a spirit of, a, a spirit of deformity that bent her into that position. Whatever represents any spirit of deformity that is ravaging any life here, by the encounter you are having with the word of the Lord, I see that spirit of infirmity shattered in the name of Jesus. Now, how does the word of God empower us for dominion over sickness and disease? How does the word of God empower us for dominion 
over sickness and disease. It's important to note that God's word is the balm in Gilead, while Jesus is the great physician. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20 to 22, the Bible says there's no balm in Gilead. Is there no physician there? Why then is not the daughter of the health of the daughter of my people re re recovered? God's word is the balm in Gilead, and Jesus Christ is the great physician that is there. Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent his word and his word healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. So the word of God is the balm in Gilead. Also take note that according to scriptures, when the light of the word breaks forth, our health springs up speedily. When the light of the word breaks forth, our health springs up speedily. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 8. The Bible tells us there, it says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. The light breaks forth, and health springs up. Remember that the dominion of light over darkness is instant and unquestionable. It does, it's, it's not a time waster. When light comes, darkness goes. When light comes, darkness goes. May I say this? It will help us. The most important requirement that you and I have to walk practically in liberty over sickness and disease is the light and revelation of God's word. The light and the revelation of God's word. I remember some years ago we had an incident where a particular woman was brought to the office and one of our pastors was attending to her and this woman was not born again. So the first thing he did, she was brought to the office with a wheelchair. First thing he did was sit down with her and lead her to Christ. And after leading her to Christ, he said, do you know that Jesus can heal you? He can set you free? And he began to explain to her from the scriptures just taking the word of God one by one, line by line, precept upon precept, just explaining the word of healing to her. And by the time they were concluding, before we knew it, the lady who came on on the wheelchair with her mother behind her pushing her, just stood up on her feet, took the wheelchair and pushed the wheelchair out of the office. What is it that gave her liberty? The light of the word. There was no prayer. It was just the word of God. Just listening to the word. Listening to the word. And as a result of that, her faith being activated. Now it's time to go. She stood up on her feet. Took the wheelchair. And pushed the wheelchair out of the place. The person who just gave her life to Christ. Now, now, now. Just by the word. Say with me, the word is enough. Come on, say it louder. The word is enough. Say it like you mean it. The word is enough. One more time. The word is enough. Now, one can be set free by the anointing. But we can only stay free by the revelation of the word. One can be set free by the anointing. But we can only stay free by the revelation of the word. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45, we are told there... Matthew 12, 43 to 45, it says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes around the, light, the dry places of the earth. When he finds no place of rest, he comes back again. And if he finds the place that he left dry and cleaned up and, you know, thoroughly swept and garnished, he said he goes and brings forth seven other devils worse than himself and come into the man and the end of that man is worse than the beginning thereof. The key thing about the man is that he's empty. Word emptiness, like God, someone our father said in the first two services, is a risk. Word emptiness. That's why the Bible says, let the word of God dwell richly in you. Let the word of God dwell richly. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of God dwell richly in you. It is by the light from the word that we command dominion over the powers of darkness. It is by the light from the word that we command dominion over the powers of darkness. This is so important. 
So it is true that the anointing can pull us out of the kingdom of darkness, but only light can keep us from being recaptured. It can pull us out, but only light can keep us from being recaptured. Without a hold on what is written, we have no resistance against the incursions of the wicked. My prayer today is that no one here will ever be recaptured again. Yeah. When Jesus was confronted, what you kept hearing, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. It is through what is written that we are able to shatter the hold of the wicked. Again, I pray that for each one of us, every hold of the wicked upon our lives, by the word of the Lord, I see each one walking into practical liberty. If you believe it, say loud, amen. I said, if you believe it, say loud, amen. If you believe it, say the loudest, amen. This is so important. We are told in the physical that man cannot live more than 40 days without food and water. And what food and water is to the physical man is what the word of God is to the spiritual man. It's our food, it's our water. So it is what keeps our spirit man alive. And it's when your spirit is alive and charged that it can take over your body. When your spirit man is alive and charged, that's when it can take dominion over your body. That is why you cannot afford to toy with your access to the world. Your access to the world. Don't toy with it. Every opportunity with the world is another opportunity to build up your spirit man. And when your spirit man is built up, the enemy has no avenue to show up. For somebody here today, I see every opportunity of the enemy to show up in our lives cancelled from today. Yeah. Quickly, what is in the word that heals? What is in the word that heals? Number one, the word of God is medicinal. The word of God is medicinal. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 to 22. Look at what the Bible tells us here. It said, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. He said, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. He said, because they are life unto those that find them and they are health. That word health means medicine to all thy flesh. So when the word of God is taken in, it comes into us as medicine. It is a spiritual medication. And that means that it has the capacity to provoke recovery. In the book of Job chapter 33, verse 21 and verse, down to verse 25, the Bible says his flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen. He said his bones that were not seen stick out. He said, yeah, his soul draweth near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. He said, but if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, he said, then he is gracious to him and said deliver him from going down to the pit I have found a ransom and then he said in verse 25 his flesh shall be fresher than a child's he shall return unto the days of his youth he hears the word of the interpreter and the result of it is that there is a supernatural recovery that is triggered so the word of God is medicine it is our medication it has the capacity to provoke recovery from whatever has been tormenting and assaulting our bodies. Today, by the power of the word of the Lord, I declare that whatever has been assaulting your body, today marks the day of your recovery. A particular woman was taken on by, a, by, by you know, a particular disease. I believe it was diabetes or so. And she was told that her feet were supposed to be amputated. And suddenly she went back and began to eat on the word of God. She was consuming the word, looking for the right word that will provoke her recovery. And she came to a scripture in the book of Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 26. A very, very strange scripture that does not seem to look like it is a healing scripture. But look at what it says. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and it shall keep thy foot from being taken. The Lord shall be thy confidence 
And it will keep your foot from being taken. They wanted to take her feet. But she caught the word. And it triggered her recovery. She's still standing on her feet today. By the word. For somebody hearing my voice. Today the word that will trigger your recovery. Is releasing your direction. Number two, the word is surgical. The word is surgical. The word is surgical. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. Was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So if it was made, it is the word that made it. If it was made, it is the word that made it. Earlier when I was growing and I used to read about how God took the rib out of, out of Adam's side. I, 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 I used to have this imagination that God just put Adam to sleep and then, you know, opened Adam up with his hand, put his hand inside Adam and took out the rib and then put the body of Adam back together. But the Bible says that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Eve was made. How was she made? By the same word that made Adam. Because there is nothing that was made that was not word made. So how did Adam's rib come out of his body? It was by the word God put Adam to sleep. It was by the word God cut Adam open. It was by the word God took Adam's rib out. It was by the word God closed Adam up. It was by the word God took the rib and made Eve. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now to further solidify the reality of that truth. God's word is God's capel. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing and dividing asunder between the soul and the marrow and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hear me and hear me very well. Right now as the word is going on there are divine surgeries taking place. I said there are divine surgeries taking place. Somebody believe say louder amen. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So if Eve was made by a surgical procedure, the surgery was performed by the word. Now listen to this. Some years ago, a particular in one of our churches somewhere in Europe, we had, there was a, a you know, a healing service and right, I mean a healing, um, you know, session. And after the word was taught about healing, you know, uh, healing school as it were. And then after the word was taught about healing, they were to pray for those who were sick. And a woman was sitting there that had fibroid in her womb. And she folded her hands and was thinking about the word that she has just heard. She was just thinking about the word that she, she, was, she had just heard. People were being prayed for, but she was thinking the word. And suddenly while she was standing there with her hand folded, she heard a sound. Bah! And looked around. Looked down. The fibroid she had dematerialized and started flowing out of her body. She had to rush to the restroom. Fibroid that was there was surgically removed by the surgical word. By the surgical word. I like us to understand today that we are we are before we are right now in the theater of heaven. Somebody say, oh, but, but, but you need a knife. Do you know that the natural mirrors the spiritual? In the natural, for example, there is now what you call laser surgery. Laser surgery is where they use a beam of light. They don't need to open the body. That light is put by the body and it goes into the body to perform the surgery without the body being open. That is a mirror of the spiritual because the word of God is light. 
Somebody here is entering into liberty this morning. Number three, the word is creative. The word is creative. All through the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1 to 31, everything that was created was created by the instrumentality of the word of God. Hebrews 11 and verse 3, by faith we believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things that do not appear, that appear were made out of things that do not appear. The word of God is creative. So whatever is missing, God's word can recreate it. Whatever is missing, the only raw material required for God's creation is the word. That's the only raw material required for God's creation is the word. God needs nothing but his word. When the word goes forth, it carries in it creative force. Creative force. Creative force. So perhaps maybe there is an organ on the body that is even been taken out. The word can recreate it. It has the capacity to recreate it. It has the capacity to recreate it. I don't know what is damaged beyond repair. In anyone's body here today, I see the word of God recreating it. You believe it? Say louder, amen. Number four, the word of God is prophetic. It is prophetic. It is prophetic. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 to 14. The Bible tells us there, it said, son of man, can these bones live again? He said, Lord, thou knowest. He said, now prophesy. And as I prophesied, bone came to the bone. I prophesied, flesh covered the bones. Sinews came, and then the flesh was covered by skin. And I prophesied, and then the wind of God breathed upon the dead, and they arose as a great army. Prophecy. The word of God is prophetic. The word of God is prophetic. Prophecy is God's avenue of unleashing his hand. He said, that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, his hand has performed it. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 15. So by the prophetic word that you are going to be receiving today, when God's servant stands upon this altar, the hand of God will be stretched in your direction. And your miracles shall be supernaturally delivered. Number five, the word is fire that burns off every walk of the wicked in and around our lives. It is fire. He said, it's my word not as fire. It's my word not as fire. So the word of God is fire. And what kind of fire? It is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. And God is his word and his word is him. So the word of God is a consuming fire that has the capacity to consume every walk of the wicked that is tormenting our lives. I don't know what fingerprint of the wicked is upon any department of your life. The word, the fire of the word will consume it this morning. Somebody believe it, say loud, amen. amen. Number six, the word transmits divine nature, which is immune to sickness and disease. It transmits divine nature. Second Peter chapter one and verse four, the Bible tells us, wherefore are given unto us exceeding and great, great and precious promises, that by this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the word of God infuses divine nature. It infuses divine nature. Now listen, there is a geological process they call jasperization where a piece of wood is put under water, maybe under a stream, and then water keeps flowing over it and it continues like that for years and years and years. And over time, something begins to happen to the wood. The minerals that make that wood look like wood are washed away. And then the wood starts becoming like stone. It was wood, but through the process of the passing of the water, the wood nature was taken out. And then it took on a new nature. Is somebody getting it now? So wood inside water. And then they begin to pass it, pass the water over it. Pass the water over it. And all the minerals inside the wood that make that wood like wood are washed away over time. Usually this takes many, 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 many years. And suddenly you discover that when you go to that wood now, it is no longer with the consistency of wood. It now looks like stone. They call it jasperization. Now the word of God is water. And the believer is supposed to be a living stone. When God's word begins to come on you, all the human limitations, human, it is human to be sick, it is not divine to be sick. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? It begins to wash away that nature. And before you know it, you start looking more like Christ. You start looking more like Christ. Who is Christ? The chief cornerstone. Who should you be? A living stone. So as the word of God keeps passing over you, it is washing away the limitations of human nature and infusing into you the, the supremacy of divine nature. The nature of God manifesting through you so that they can look at you like they looked at Paul and say, the gods are come to us in the likeness of men. They look like men, but really they are gods. For somebody hearing my voice today, via the word of the Lord you are hearing today and that you'll be hearing all through this month, every limitation of the human nature shall be cleared of your life. In the name of Jesus Christ. In conclusion of this portion, it's important to know that the word of God is a weapon of instant healing and wholeness. Instant healing and wholeness. Instant. He said, the spirit entered into me when he spake and set me upon my feet. At that same moment, he entered and set me. Today, by the word of the Lord that you are hearing, I see each one of us being set totally free from every siege of sickness and disease. You believe God say loud, amen. amen. Now, today is our covenant day of restoration has been prophetically declared as a restoration assembly. Take note of the following. God's last day agenda for his children is to recover all that the devil has stolen from them. Recover all. The Bible tells in the book of Joel chapter 2, verse 23, 23 down to verse 26. It tells us there, among other things, he said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6 to 9, David asked, Lord, shall I pursue them? And the Lord said, pursue for you will surely overtake them and without fail, you will recover all. Whatever Satan has taken from anyone's life, anyone's destiny, anyone's family shall be supernaturally recovered. God's plan is to replace with seven for any one door that the devil may have shut against his children. Seven. So one door closed, seven was open. To replace with seven. Furthermore, restoration here, among others, includes restoration of lost years, health, glory, etc. Whatever belongs to you that was lost, your health was lost, God is set to restore it. Whatever it is. Your glory is set to restore it. Whatever it is, any area of loss, your years is set to restore it. Did you hear the testimony of one of us for 20 years was out of his job? Falsely so. But then when God restored it, it didn't just bring him back to the job, but all accumulated salaries, accumulated promotions, 20 years worth of them, everything was paid back to him and he was restored at the position he should be, not where he was. That is what you call comprehensive restoration. Somebody here is getting comprehensive restoration. But to, re to secure our restoration, we must take note of the following. Number one, one must be born again and remain so. Restoration requires salvation. One must be born again and remain so. Romans 3 and verse 23. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, he said, Whom he did for know, he also did predestinate. He said that they should be conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. He said, Whom he did, moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And him we justified, he also glorified. So the journey back to the restoration of the lost glory, the lost blessing, begins first with salvation. Begins first with salvation. But salvation does not end at new birth. It requires new living. New living. A new lifestyle. That's why the Bible tells us that we are ordained to walk in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. So it's not enough just to be born again, but to live out this new life. We must live according to the righteous standard of God. 
Number two, one must receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is ordained to facilitate our restoration. If you look at Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3, it talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and his manifestation, particularly through Jesus Christ. And from verse 4 down to verse 7, it talks about the restoration effect of it. He said they will build the old waste. He said they would raise up the former desolations. They will repair the desolation, the, the waste cities and the desolation of many generations. All things begin to come restored. He said, for your shame, you shall have double. Blessing upon blessing, restoration upon restoration because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25 to 27, we are told there, he said, I will restore the years. The locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar. And the reason all of this will happen, he said, is because I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. So restoration requires the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Number three, we must receive and believe the word for our restoration to experience restoration. We must believe and receive. The word comes, we must receive, it comes by the word. We must believe and receive it. How many people here believe that they are taking hold of their own restoration today? Does somebody here believe it? I said, do you believe it? I said, do you believe it? You must receive and believe. You must receive and believe the word of restoration to experience that restoration that God has in store for you. The Bible said concerning the man Joseph, he said, until the time that his word came, the king sent for him and loosed him and made him ruler of the people. He was catapulted to the top Restored for all the losses. For 13 years, he went through what looked like, you know, an, an, an irreparable situation. Everything looked upside down. Everything looked like there was no room for restoration. But suddenly, when the word came, the king sent for him and loosed him. He emerged to the throne at the age of 30. And he died on the throne at the age of 110. 13 years of what looked like oppression, but 80 years of rulership. That's what you call comprehensive restoration. And it came by the word. By the word that you are receiving today, I see your own comprehensive restoration coming your way. Yeah. Number four, remain committed to serving God and the interests of his kingdom. Remain committed to serving God and the interests of his kingdom. We see that in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 3 down to verse 6, and verse 12 to 15. There was supernatural restoration as the land of Judah committed themselves to serving God. Everything that was lost was returned on the basis of serving God. One of us shared how that her family had been broken down for 24 years. 24 years family broken down. And according to her, she said initially she was always praying for the family. Always praying for the family. All of those 24 years she never stopped praying for the family. But suddenly she switched on and took on the kingdom. And began to bear the kingdom on her shoulders. Everything about the kingdom was what was driving her. Her prayer for the kingdom. On the field for the kingdom. Everywhere for the kingdom. And suddenly the 24 year broken down marriage was restored. Simply by seeking the kingdom. For somebody here, particularly as a result of all of the engagement that you have had till this time, there will be supernatural restoration for you. <laughs> Finally, number five is we must be committed to praying for the well-being of others to secure our own restoration. Be committed to praying for the well-being of others to secure our own restoration. Job's captivity turned when he prayed for his friends. Job 42 and verse 10. As he prayed for his friends, his captivity turned. As you stand in a gap for others, I see every captivity around any life being turned supernaturally. Lift your hand to heaven. Give thanks to God for his word that you have received this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed.